Okay, can you guys hear me okay? All right, thanks so much for coming. Um, it's my absolute pleasure to introduce Dr. Karan Jani, who's visiting us today from Vanderbilt University. Dr. Jani is a Cornelius Vanderbilt Dean's Faculty Fellow in Astrophysics, serves as the founding director of Vanderbilt Lunar Labs Initiative, and holds professor appointments in physics and astronomy, as well as data science, communication of science and technology. Gutten has been a trailblazer from the start. He started his early days growing up in a Gujarati household in a town in India where he spent his days wondering how the universe works. This question propelled him forward to, the first, er, to first earning his Bachelor of Science degrees in astronomy, astrophysics, and in physics with a minor in mathematics from Penn State and then a PhD from Georgia Tech. For over a decade, his research has focused on gravitational waves, and today he's here to tell us a little bit more about the era of intermediate mass black holes and gravitational waves. And then later today, during at lunch, he will give us an exciting sneak peek into the moon as the next frontier for multi-messenger astrophysics. Thanks so much. Well, 
Thank you very much, uh, Jasmine, and the organizers for inviting me to, to, to ITC. It's a true privilege to come visit. I believe the last time I was here, we, it was the pre-pandemic day, so my memory was pretty blurry on you know, how exactly the, the visits and the, the, the whole process was. So pretty excited this time to be back and speaking with everyone. Uh, I'm going to give this two-part talk, so later I'll speak a lot more about what has been a focus of my work in the last few years, much courtesy to the last visit I made at CFA uh, and a conversation with Avi changed the track much of my research from that point. Uh, the one that I'm going to speak about today is a sort of this ongoing uh, work. I, I read from this talk from Avi from a long back that, you know, you invest into like fixed research and then you have this sort of a research that pays off in the long run, high risk, high reward. Uh, this one is more sort of the things that we have been doing on in LIGO now for uh, almost over a decade. And that's, I'm just going to give a summary of everything that we have learned about intermediate mass black holes. We had a very nice conference of on IMBHs that happened at uh, San Pedro in Belize uh, just recently in December. It was chaired by a former alumni of a CFA, Giacomo Fregion. Um, this is the moonrise that we were able to see at the, at the conference on the, on the day one. So that sort of sets, you know, we are in the sort of a moonrise of IMBH science that we can do with gravitational waves. Um, we have now 90 confirmed discoveries of gravitational waves between 2015 to 2020. So the last time when I was here, we only had just the first row of gravitational wave events that were confirmed and published. There were other events, but of course we could not tell publicly what all the discoveries we have made. Uh, the first, uh, first three are from our O1, which is the first observing run of LIGO. Uh, this one is the famous uh, GW5914, the discovery of gravitational waves. Uh, here, each box indicates the spectrogram of the time frequency map. So this is exactly how the LIGO data sees it, you know, without any post-processing of whether the equation fits Einstein's general relativity or not. This is exactly our data. The second observing run had the famous event, which was the binary neutron star merger, GW170817, the only multi-messenger event till date. And then everything else you see was found in the third observing run of LIGO. Now, the one that of every black hole has a unique story to tell and you know, a unique science that we have done out of series of these discoveries. But I would argue that the most unexpected discovery in the 90 has been this blob that happened on May 21st of uh, 2019. Now going before that, back when I started as a graduate student, um, it was, uh, it was the era when the gravitational waves, I would say in the Star Wars analogy, we were in the end of the Clone Wars. Uh, we had just, uh, the Astro 2010 decadal had canceled the LISA space mission. Uh, I was very interested to look for intermediate mass black hole and uh, we had a senior person visiting and as an exciting grad student, I shared that, oh, this is what I want to uh, pursue in, the, in, in doctoral work. I was told by all the wise people also back then that looking for intermediate mass black hole in LIGO is futile. And the word IMBH here, we very loosely define intermediate mass black hole as anything that is greater than 50 solar mass in binaries. Back then, that is what we were looking as a convention. We will not detect black holes about 20 solar masses. Uh, if they exist, we would have already seen them as X-ray binaries. Um, as we learn from uh, time and again how the old predictions can come out to be quite falsified over the time. And so my naive argument as, a, as an early student was, but we can see intermediate mass black holes 30 times farther than the binary neutron stars in LIGO. So surely there is some reasons to search rare phenomenon out there, even if we are not predicting. Fast forward to September to 2020, when we announced the discovery of the GW1905-21, which was a binary black hole merger with a total mass of 150 solar masses. Um, the, we had a press release at the time press conference, 
which sadly happened over Zoom. Otherwise, we would have been either at uh, the NSF or, uh, or the, the equivalent in, in Europe. Uh, I announced the discovery on behalf of the LIGO collaboration. We had my colleagues from the Virgo collaboration. The New York Times that day had this press article on this discovery, which rightly said this black holes shouldn't exist. But there they are. Right? So my, as I started as a faculty, a motto of my lab was that we would have an astrophysics agnostic ambient science. We would not marry ourselves with a particular formation channel, a, tech, a method of which or how IMBH is formed. We would try to answer as much independently as we can about the population of IMBHs that exist. The lab is uh, two prize postdoctoral fellows, uh, six graduate students, four undergraduate students, and uh, uh, communication and admin specialist. And we are hiring. Uh, so if anyone has an incoming graduate student, please, please absolutely do reach out for postdocs. So the guiding questions that we now ask is, with current and upcoming and proposed gravitational wave detector, what parameter space of IMBH binaries we can cover? And how far in the cosmic time we can find this binary? Right? This is really our starting point for all investigations. The thing which we have learned from LIGO is the harder part is how can we be sure the signal actually originated from an IMBH binary and not something else? And the something else in the context of the next 15 years is always a detector glitch. Uh, are the IM gravitational wave signals from IMBH consistent with Einstein's equation in standard cosmology? They absolutely have to, but can we use them as a probe to answer this question? And once we have discovered an IMBH, in the case, let's say, the GW1905-21, how well can you constrain the mass, the spin, and in some cases, the recoil velocity of the IMBH that has just born? Can we learn something about the binary itself? That is, do we learn if it was in an eccentric orbit? What is the environment around them? Are they in vacuum? Are they in gas? And at the end, do we learn anything about the formation rate? So what is the merger rate of the system as a function of redshift, right? So this is the things that we try to give out to the community, independent of choosing which way the intermediate mass black holes form. The challenge, of course, with IMBHs is it is so broad that no single gravitational wave detector can fully answer their astrophysics. There is this nice line from the review by Jenny Green at Princeton that intermediate mass black holes are often introduced as what they are not. So the boundary that we generally consider is when, the question is when does the, what is the heaviest stellar black hole? At what total mass does it end? Uh, so for long in LIGO, we thought anything above 50 solar masses is an IMBH because, yeah, with stellar black holes should not be there. Now that definition has pushed. On the other end is like, what is the lightest supermassive black hole, right? And which rate we, we sort of stop considering that. Um, because it's such a huge parameter space, I have now started calling IMBHs, the intermediate mass black hole, as three different class of objects. There is one which is this light IMBHs, which are roughly your 100 solar mass black holes. They also overlap in this uncertain way with what we have this black hole mass gap that comes from the pair instability supernova. So between a 50 or 40 or 60 solar mass is uncertain when the gap starts, but from their range to up to 100, 120, we should have no black holes. And we have already seen with LIGO that there are black holes in this mass gap. And then the farthest end, we would have this heavy IMBH is roughly around 100,000 solar mass. Right? Independent of where in the universe they are formed, the fact if they are in binaries, we could use, let's say if they are in equal mass binaries, then just using a, um, a simple last stable orbit calculation, we can ask what is the frequency of gravitational waves they would be emitting. So you can see all the light IMBHs would be emitting gravitational waves greater than about 20 hertz. And all the heavy intermediate mass black holes would be emitting somewhere around you know, 20 millihertz of gravitational waves. In the context of the detectors we have present to answer this, 
We have LIGO currently operating, which would go from 10 to about a few thousand hertz. So all your light EMBH population is really where this is the detector we will be best able to answer them. Then we have this upcoming gravitational wave detector in space, the LISA, which looks at a broad frequency from 0.1 hertz to about 10 to the power of minus 5 hertz. So it covers a wide range of supermassive black hole, but it also covers this heavy IMBHs that we would see. However, there is this in between the two phase where really we don't have any gravitational wave detector that can answer what happens to the 1,000 solar mass IMBHs, what happens to the 10,000 solar mass IMBHs. There is some overlap that LISA may see. There is some overlap that the ground-based detector may in the next 20 year reach it. But by and large, this whole mid-IMBH range is completely undetected with any gravitational wave detector. The challenge is even further difficult with gravitational waves search of IMBHs is the mass ratio we don't know. In the case of stellar black holes that LIGO has seen, predominantly all the black holes have been near equal mass system. There is a certain selection effect, but we have overcome that selection effect now by and large, and we are sensitive to unequal mass ratio mergers of intermediate mass black holes. But to do that, we, I mean, we just don't know the first principle, what is the, uh, the preferred mass ratio range. IMBHs, apart from this whole mass range, can also be in a, uh, have a primary component, which is a supermassive black hole, which would be a source in LISA. It could be within the IMBHs itself that can go from mass ratio of nearly one to about a thousand. Then it can be in binaries with stellar black holes, uh, which would be mass ratios of hundreds or thousands, and neutron star, which would be millions, and white dwarf, which would be then tidal disruption events. And one can even think of more exotic, uh, like subsolar mass dark matter candidates around black holes. So we have to first cover this five orders of magnitude in mass ratio to understand. That requires us to know the solutions to Einstein's equation pre-hand for all of this system. Further, the gravitational wave detection chances scale inversely with mass ratio. So every time we add further and further, we have smaller the volume of the universe we are sensitive to. And so it requires a very high sensitivity across three orders of magnitude. Uh, for detecting gravitational waves. And three orders, specifically in the region where LIGO is the least sensitive, LISA is the least sensitive, and mid-band, we just don't have the detector. So this is a quite a challenge we have. However, we, I mean, besides the challenge, we have been overcoming and searching for gravitational waves from LIGO from a very long time. In fact, start in 2005 to 2010, which was the initial runs of LIGO, the 10 year period where LIGO did not make any gravitational wave discovery, we were looking for, um, for intermediate mass black holes. In fact, the heaviest black hole we could have detected in the initial LIGO was a 500 solar mass black hole merger up to 25 megaparsecs. So that's not too far in the realm of you know, where the binary black hole astrophysics occurs. Uh, for reference, the first discovery happened at 400 megaparsec, the first binary black hole merger. And this is a plot at the time that was produced on how in the M1, M2 space and the colors represents distance in megaparsec, they were pretty sensitive to a 100 plus 100 solar mass system that could have been seen up to 200 megaparsec at the time. Nothing that would be sensitive enough to discover gravitational waves like we discover now but at least we were looking at, uh, at the constraints even back then, and there were a series of papers that were published. It was also realized back from the early search that the best way to search IMBHs is what we call this unmodeled wavelet search. We only look for excess power between the two combinations of LIGO detectors. We do not need the match filtering searches. We do not need to know the what is the Einstein's equation solution for IMBHs. We are absolutely all right finding IMBHs just using an unmodeled analysis. The question though is once we find, is it enough to tell us if the system is IMBHs? The answer is no. That's when we do need the solutions. But we could at least make the searches. Run in 2015, 16, this is the era of the advanced LIGO detectors. Uh, the heaviest black hole we had detected was the first black hole, which was a 35 plus 30 solar mass in the error bars, which created a 62 solar mass, IM, uh, 62 solar mass black hole. Um, Initial days, I used to keep calling this, this an IMBH, because that is how we had defined that, that anything above 50. In fact, there were no searches looking for black holes this big using match filter techniques, because that whole templates were thought to be binary neutron star, neutron star black holes, 
and small stellar black holes. So I was really searching for this system back then. This is the constraint we have on the final mass in the source frame, which is, uh, I'll get to that in the cosmology a bit. And this is the uh, curved spin parameter, the spin magnitude of the black hole. And we have constrained this just using gravitational wave measurements, right? And you can already see that the constraints is fairly robust. This is a, a highly spinning black hole, which we expect even if two non-spinning black holes would have collided, the spins would be somewhere around 0.7, and which is consistent to that. We also find the black hole mass to be around 62 solar mass, right? So this is where we were in 2016. Now, at the time when we made this discovery, the most sensitive thing LIGO could have found was about a 200 solar mass black hole, about 100 plus 100. So here is the horizon distance in megaparsec, which reflects how far the detector is sensitive to. Uh, the x-axis is the mass, total mass of the binary in the source frame. Uh, the contours refer to different observing runs. So this is what LIGO was in 2009-10, the blue contours, and yellow and orange is what Livingston and Hanford were in 2015 and 16. So you could already see the volume increase that has happened in LIGO to look for intermediate mass black holes. It particularly is, uh, it also pushes total mass we can see, how far we can see. It has to do with the fact that the low frequency sensitivity of the LIGO detectors improved substantially in those five years, right? At the time of the first observing run, we could have seen a 600 solar mass black hole binary up to 600 megaparsec. We did not see that, and that gives us the most astrophysically strongest constraints we have on, on the system at the time. Further, 2016 and 17 things advanced. We started confirming black holes, which are nearly 95 solar masses. Um, we also start seeing this interesting phenomenon of candidates, and this is a reflection of the field being new. When you use the word GW, we typically associate, we have confirmed the discovery. But what if someone outside finds a black hole in your open data, which LIGO collaboration missed? And that started happening. The Princeton group uh, found a black hole candidate, which was about uh, a nearly 100 solar masses. Here, again, it's a total mass as a function of luminosity distance. Here, the units have now become gigaparsecs. Uh, the blue contours are what the LIGO had reported back then. The heaviest black hole we had found was close to 90 solar masses. Independent groups started finding even heavier black holes. And uh, one of the black holes we had known in LIGO, but we had discarded because we could not confirm whether it's a trigger, like a detector glitch, or a black hole. We did the analysis of it, and it ends up being around a 150 solar mass black hole. The error bars are, of course, huge, because the signal-to-noise ratio that we have for this massive system is not too high. The heaviest black hole we could have detected in 2017 by then was around 800 solar mass you know, we could have seen that up to 300 megaparsec, right? So we keep going further in the mass. Third observing run finally comes in in 2020 is when we have a confirmed discovery of 150 solar mass. This is again the chi effective versus the source frame mass of the black hole. These are different waveform solutions to Einstein's equation predicting what the mass could be. In certain models, we could have went all the way up to 200 solar masses, what we have seen, right? But this is within the, this is our 90% confidence interval. So we consider anything within that to be an accurate solution. Uh, the search for, of course, the heaviest black hole has now went even further higher. There is now a very growing list of black holes. We cannot confirm their gravitational wave events, but we do see them occurring um, in the LIGO data at a small, uh, at, at a lower threshold. So there is this variety of now black holes above 100 solar masses that we have kept finding uh, in the signal. This is a study done by one of my, uh, my PhD students. And um, this could be glitches. I mean, we don't know for a fact that there is a 300 solar mass black hole, but we have started looking for things, right? Right now, the fourth observing run of LIGO is going on. So what can we expect? Uh, the results are not public. The data is not public. Uh, every new run, we are beating the record of heaviest black hole by 50%. Uh, can there be a 200 solar mass black hole merger? So stay tuned for another year or two until we make our data public. Well, let's start with this most more likely assumption that what if we don't find 200 solar mass black holes now? What if we don't see anything beyond 150 solar mass? Then the upper limits gets constrained further by almost 50% every run. In fact, the current LIGO limits 
This is the astrophysical limits that we have on population. The mergers of 200 solar mass black holes are 700 to 300 times less common in the local universe than stellar black holes. Expected that we don't see much heavier black holes, but the constraints are so far down that if this goes beyond by a factor of 10, uh, we should start assuming that there are really no black holes uh, in, in that mass gap that are being produced. Any questions so far? How am I doing on time? Okay, um, I'm going to sketch the, uh, the detector glitch part and stick with the astrophysics as much as I can. There is the new additions now we are doing is we have, uh, we're trying to find the signals in for intermediate mass black holes, bypassing all the traditional searches and using deep learning in the process to find the signal. Here is just a representation that if we had the heaviest mass black hole discoveries, and these are the two actual discoveries, if we had a machine learning algorithm, it, it predicts this red line while the green line is what our traditional LIGO searches would have found, right? So the systems are, we are trying to enhance to look better and more in the, in the, in the detector data. The another thing that we are keep on going doing it is we're trying to understand what we learn about cosmology in the process. Now the reason is the, every time we measure black holes, we measure them in the detector frame. So the black holes we have observed, which are 150 solar mass came from redshift of around 0.8. So the mass is about 1.6 times greater than the, uh, uh, in, in our detector than what actually it was emitted by the source. So we have to assume a certain cosmology to get back and tell us what is the mass of the black hole in its source frame. Um, if we assume different cosmologies between Planck and uh, Schuess, the result should not be changing more than a few percent, which is the inherent error bar that LIGO right now has. So we won't be doing anything better than that. But just as a, as a, as a map, so here green, uh, red dotted line, this is distance of the binaries that we will find, and this is the detector frame mass that we would assume. These are all the LIGO sources we have measured so far. And these are just the dotted lines shows what the uh, shoes result would be uh, from supernova on the H naught. And if we assume that, what is the mass we get? Versus the blue being, if we assume the Planck mass, uh, Planck cosmology, what is the total mass we can get? And then one can compute what is the best overlap. You know, if, if there is an inherent gap in the black hole distribution that black holes cannot be greater than 60 solar mass or has to be greater than 120 solar mass, we can start putting constraints on the cosmology in the process. And we've been doing that. Uh, now LIGO publishes the constraint on Hubble constant omega matter, just assuming that there is a black hole mass distribution. That there is an inherent, like there is no greater than 90 solar mass mass, there is no greater than 100 solar mass. So you can go back and constrain cosmology in the process. The constraints are nowhere close in orders of magnitude with what the field already has. Uh, but this is still just an independent way that we know we can learn about some of this. This is the H naught constraint uh, based on uh, based on the different assumption of how the black hole mass uh, distribution scales. Uh, and this is the same constant omega matter, which is as good as, you know, it's absolutely broad. The things we would learn from now till 2035 is everything that I have said. There is nothing else we would be learning about intermediate mass black holes. The, these are the five gravitational wave detectors that are running. They will be start running and they will continue to run until the end of next decade. The newest addition would be the LIGO detector in India. Uh, we expect that the LIGO detectors in the US would go through some form of upgrades than what they are right now. If you think about the redshift. Is that picture real? No, no. Okay. It's, some, uh, uh, it, it's an artistic, yeah, for, some CAD drawing. For, for, for. Yes. For, for, why is there a movie? Oh, <laughs> that's a good question. That's all. <laughs> they didn't, they didn't <laughs> consider that if there is a, I, I hope that the, the pool doesn't cause enough. Newtonian noise in the measurement of the LIGO. The wave wider. 20 hertz waves. 20 hertz waves, right? <laughs> so the the heaviest black hole this combination of detectors can see is about 2,000 solar mass. Right? That's everything we could search. Um, the space-time volume of these black holes would 
almost not cross redshift one. You can assume, right, this is a plot of redshift as a function of solar mass. This is where right now LIGO is funded through NSF to look at. If we get future funding, we may get, you know, better extension on how far we can see. It's very suboptimal improvements, right? This is not a path-breaking search for intermediate mass black holes we can do here now. If we consider this in context of what electromagnetic astronomy has already told us about IMBHs, this is much more, you know, all the IMBHs that we have found through electromagnetic candidates are at heavier total masses, albeit not at the high distances. All the LIGO black holes that we have considered IMBHs are roughly lying here. And for the next 15 years, we would almost not have any overlap with a joint science between electromagnetic IMBHs and the gravitational wave IMBHs. That, of course, things change substantially when the space mission LISA would fly. Um, this is a same plot of redshift versus solar mass, and now you can see the, the IMBH mass range covered in LISA and up to the redshifts which can go practically entire observable universe. Right? So LISA is the best gravitational wave detector one can build to study this high mass uh, intermediate mass black holes and the connected science to the supermassive black hole. We finally have the space mission LISA ready to go. Um, it's, it's, it's a little sort of mixed feeling. I was a freshman undergrad when I was working on the LISA mission. And now my freshman undergrad also works on the LISA mission. And it is still as far as it was told, told to me back then that oh, we are gonna, you know, the early abstract was the LISA is gonna fly in 2018. And, um, uh, and uh, I hope, you know, we stick with the 2035 timeline. One thing that most people don't sort of realize that LISA is not an eternal mission like LIGO. It will only run for four years to 10 years. The mission does not, it, it has this free floating orbits around the earth. Um, it's not always having a 100% duty cycle either because every time the orbit shifts, you have to adjust the detector back to keep the triangular geometry. After a point, you will run out of the thrusters and the geometry is no longer maintained because of the pull from the Earth, from the Jupiter, et cetera. And then the LISA mission would be over. You can store the entire LISA data in a USB stick drive at the end of it. Free floating. Yes, yes, that is, that is assumed they would. So it will be small space junk. Uh, Unless some one can compute, there is a quasi mechanism that will shoot it off uh, into some other trajectories. Well, it might be useful to use them. Yes, that that is true. That is true. Um, I haven't done a good job of reviewing all the. There's so many IMBH works. Some of the early works that you know Avi had written uh, back in the uh, back in uh, time to speak about all the IMBH science we can do out of this. But the point is, LISA is not really the ultimate IMBH detector. It works only when you have equal mass IMBHs or IMBHs around supermassive black hole. Here is a mass ratio 1,000 and a mass ratio 10,000 plot of how far LISA can th see things in the universe. Uh, the contours refer to at what signal to noise ratio we can see these binaries at, the cert at different separations. If we consider redshift 3 as a threshold, that after a point or before that point, you know, because of star formation, we should have some new learning in the IMBH science. And practically an IMBH from 1,000 to 10,000 solar mass LISA does not see. Uh, LISA also does not see uh, the mergers of 10,000 solar mass black hole with supermassive black holes and vice versa. Right? There's a huge part of the parameter space of intermediate mass black holes that we don't get access from LISA alone. LISA is powerful, though, for doing what we call multi-band gravitational wave data analysis. Um, in this case, an intermediate mass black hole will live in the LISA band for four years, and it would remain in the LISA band throughout its mission lifetime. But then later, it would come back and merge in the ground-based detector like LIGO. So this is more like a multi-wavelength analysis we do for crack pulsar. You know, we look in radio, we look in x-ray, and we learn something new about it. Um, this study has really opened up the new kind of LISA science. It's very critical how long LISA runs to actually make such kind of a measurements that we are otherwise not able to, uh, able to do with the system. Um, just a very quick on what, what, how powerful LISA alone is. If you have two black holes that are merging, same total mass, same mass ratio, same spins on both the black hole, 
same effective spin, that is how much spin is aligned with the angular momentum, same precession spin, how much they are precessing, everything same. One black hole gets kicked at 1000 km per second after the merger. The other black hole only gets kicked at 60 kilometers per second. And this has to do with the nonlinear general relativistic effects on how the momentum is being radiated away, the linear momentum is being radiated away from the system. Uh, it only depends on the orientation of the spins at the time of the black hole mergers. This is extremely challenging to measure in gravitational waves. You know, if you just had a standalone LIGO detector, we would not know the difference between the two cases. We don't even see the redshift in the ring down that we could tell much about, you know, which got kicked or not. If we use LISA as a recovery of telling LIGO on how far the black holes would go, this is a case for uh, the black hole that was kicked at around 60 kilometer per second. The red contour here is if you mix LISA with a ground-based detector. And this is a different kind of detector. The green is if you take Hanford, uh, Livingston, what we have right now, and the red is if we have a more series of better combinations of detectors. Right? So that alone is transformational if it works for, Le for LISA. The only problem is that LISA would almost unlikely see any source, even if it's a great science. We would only see maybe zero or two sources because the intermediate mass black hole population is so low in rates and LISA's volume is not high enough. That has all brought us to thinking about what is the next generation detector. These are what we call the subhertz gravitational wave detector. There is a series of concepts from heliocentric orbit, geocentric space missions, atom interferometry. The one that became a focus of much of my work was the study with Avi on the gravitational wave detector on the moon. Um, I'm going to show this in a few minutes. I'll skip the cool animation of what the gravitational wave detector looks like. But quick point, why go to the moon is because moon is 1,000x quieter than Earth is at low frequency. So it opens the frequency gap that you cannot otherwise see with LIGO. And the natural vacuum is much better than what we have in LIGO right now. In terms, of the character, in terms of the sensitivity of the detector, it fits right between the two. So you have all the Earth-based detector like LIGO, you have the space-based detector like LISA, and then this concept which we call LILA now, which is laser interferometer lunar antenna, sits right between the two. If you ask in the observable universe what kind of black holes LILA sees versus what LISA or ground-based telescopes can see, here the center is how far LIGO has seen everything so far. The farthest boundary is your cosmic microwave background, and every line here is different redshifts. LISA can practically see the whole universe at 10,000 solar mass or million solar mass black holes. Einstein telescope can see with 10 solar mass to about a 60 solar mass black hole. LILA band would see 100,000 solar mass practically across the entire universe. That's the power we get by just adding one more band. Uh, there is a series of new sciences. I'll come back to that later. Um, in the interest of time, I would just skip to the part where I'll just conclude and we can have some discussion. So what does the first 15 years look like? So we are only going to have LIGO Virgo Kagra detectors that can only see black holes under 1,000 solar masses. We would have strong constraints on the rate. We will tell you really well how, we are, how many of the sources exist but we would be pretty poor in telling you what is the environment in which they are forming, what is the origins for the formation channels. After 15 years, uh, IMBHs, the heavy IMBHs LISA would see would dominate. Uh, it's uncertain if we know exactly how to solve Einstein's equation for everything that LISA can see in IMBHs. If we are lucky, we would see a few multiband gravitational wave sources. The real breakthrough science actually happens if we build a gravitational wave detector on the moon in the next decade. And just accessing this mid-IMBH solves the problems that this two band alone has. And all sources combined, it would be the, you know, the strongest multi-band gravitational wave detector. IMBHs we would see jointly with LISA and Moon, and Moon and Earth together. Right, so on that point, I'll just end on a thank you. <laughs> Thanks so much, Karan, for a great talk. Uh, we'll just take questions now. That was a lot, so I hope you enjoyed the crash course in the IMBHs and then looking at the moon as the next frontier. But uh, yeah. I'm gonna go more into the moon stuff. Yeah, Magda. 
Is this on? Yeah. Um, so thanks for this talk. I guess I'm asking about something you didn't get to, but what kind of environments do you think these IMBH mergers will be in? Do you think there are any counterparts, like electromagnetic counterparts, any gas? <laughs> yeah, I, it's, it's uncertain to us uh, if, if um, I mean, okay, let me point back to this uh, one case. So when we saw the GW1905-21 and we were writing the paper, it was under the assumption that there is no electromagnetic counterpart yet that we have seen. However, right when we were about to publish this, we heard from, um, from Physical Review Letters, I think at the time, that there is another paper that has come out to claim that there is an electromagnetic counterpart to this. This is the ZTF teams claim that there is an AGN flare associated with this discovery. Uh, the way this model works, if I understand, is that the black hole binaries of this masses, because this mass is too high for standard stellar channels, they are merging within the accretion disk. And after merger, the black hole is getting kicked. So the kick would induce eventually, not at the time, but a few days or weeks later, a flare that would happen in the AGN and that the ZTF team had found. Um, the sky localization, of course, we have is broad. The distance error bars are very broad from LIGO, uh, you know, for that to be claiming that this happens within the AGN. It has been debunked by several things. I mean, one of the ways it got debunked is that the, the, the median distance to which LIGO could have found the signal versus AGN was so much closer that it could not have had a straight association. Um, in the LISA sources, though, it is very interesting because if the AGN scenario would have held, then we would have seen the, uh, the, uh, the way the, the binary evolution would happen in LISA would be different if it would happen in vacuum or uh, gas. I didn't get to that plot, but there is a, we have done a study where we have tried to constrain the parameters on the gas disk, some hypothetical gas disk based just alone on LISA observations. So we could do that. Very few sources, though, we would be able to do it. So this is for the upper end of the IMBH? Yes, the lower end, sorry. The, um, the lower 1,000 is 100 solar mass that way. In LISA? Okay. In LISA. All right. Thanks. Uh, so two, two questions. One, um, if one is dealing with uh, an extreme mass ratio in spiral um, in the centers of galaxies. Perhaps it would be interesting to ask whether you can set uh, some constraints on the dark matter in the cusp. Yes. Now, the, the IMBH may not be, I mean, th that system may actually move around the dynamical center, but it still would be very interesting to know how much. And that's from the phase lag, not, not from. Uh, having enough mass to actually change the orbit, but it's actually just a change in phase. Mm. And the second is, uh, of course, um, there are two populations of IMBHs. One is from stellar masses, uh, like supermassive stars, that if there are stars with thousands of solar masses, they can end up making such things, um, especially at low metallicities. And the second is, of course, at the centers of dwarf galaxies. Which population is more abundant in your expectation uh, what would be the total masses, let's say, of this uh, systems we are looking at? Are they hundreds, thousands? It de yeah, it depends. It depends on the masses. Because if you go to 10 to the 4, 10 to the 5, it's more likely to be the centers of dwarf galaxies. Mm -hmm. rather than, but supermassive stars, I mean, we don't know much about, and it would be surprising. Yeah, I mean, I mean, the rates that we have from uh, continuing to do the search, you know, we are looking for as broad a distribution we can. If we have a 800 solar mass and a 10 solar mass, we could have seen them within the tens or 20 megaparsec volume. And if we had a 400 plus 400, we could have went all the way up to close to a gigaparsec to find them. Either of those combinations we are not finding. Um, the rates we expect to I think it would be nice to know at what upper limits of rate can we start eliminating the models. So right now we know that the mergers of 200 solar masses is 700 times less. So it's around 0.01 per cubic gigaparsec per year 
That is the constraints we have. I mean, that's then sort of a great... Minus, uh, X-ray sources. Some people claim that there are uh, black holes above uh, 100 solar mass. But you, you would argue no, because you would see some. If they were in equal mass scenarios, we would have had an absolute tight constraints on them by now. And it would be nice to, I think, make that kind of a plot on... If these are the... I'm guessing no one... I, I haven't seen this, that these are the different formation ideas. And which gravitational wave detector sort of can rule them out? or can test them either ways. I mean, we had one study about the binary separation of this massive stars, uh, where we had ruled out that you know, we don't really expect a very heavy masses to, of stars to be forming unless they are brought ridiculously close. Otherwise, they would not merge in the stellar budget time frame. So this, this moon observatory. It's an interesting idea. So I guess LIGO is limited at the low frequency end by a huge amount of noise. Yes. And the moon won't have that, yes. right? So on Earth, is it really, is it seismic noise from the Earth or is it human-made noise that's the main problem? It's a seismic noise. It is the... seismic, okay. And since the moon doesn't have all that convective interior. It does. It does have it at lower frequencies, okay. as we currently understand. You know, since the Apollo era, actually, they were doing, doing the seismometers. I have a plot on, oh, I just went back, sorry. Oh, instead of going further up. So even back, the, the idea that Weber had in the Apollo 17, he sent a gravitational wave detector to the moon. It was the last, actually, it's the only gravitational wave detector that has been on outside Earth, uh, was that the moon would be seismically so quiet that we would be able to see these vertical resonances. Too bad it didn't work out, but it was a solid constraint uh, that we could have produced. Uh, since then, though, every a uh, lot of lunar seismic modeling has shown that the moon quakes and everything would be affecting at lower frequencies than what you know we are trying to measure. And that is the limit? That's what Our limits. fundamental limit is not the seismic actually. Our fundamental limit is the suspension of the test mass. The thermal noise that is induced because we are trying to suspend our test masses, that induces a very strict limit. Uh, we don't, I mean, this concept of moon is really between the two extremes because LISA is free floating satellites. LIGO is suspended uh, system, but in the, it has to go at great length at making it seismically isolated from the environment. The moon, we are isolated, so we don't need the kind of suspension rigidity that we require on Earth. Um, it's almost, it's still uncertain if there are R&D ideas, you know, if there is a levitating test mass that we could have in a cryogenic kind of a scenario, it would substantially then from 0.1 hertz, we would go even further lower frequencies. Okay, so want to be in the shadow from the sun, obviously. Yes. How cold does it get? It, it on, on the surface, we vary from minus 150 to 150. Yeah, 150 is pretty cold. It, it, it is pretty cold, but it's not cold enough for us to reduce the suspension noise. It's cold enough for us to worry about the electronics functioning in the lunar night. And the location, I guess it doesn't have to be on the far side. Yeah, it right? can be anywhere. It can be. It, it has a certain <laughs> impact on the sky localization. So I have a postdoc looking at this. That if So the, the moon is finishing this orbit around the Earth. So the effective baseline is your moon-Earth separation. But depending on where you put this triangle or L-shaped geometry, whichever is the feasible thing, it affects the antenna pattern. And then there are some parts of the sky from which sky localization would not be great. And so you want to maximize as much as you can the sky localization on the moon. In that regard, but by and large, yes, this is in, unlike radio astronomy, which can only be on far side, we are much more flexible. Yeah, actually, I have one other question. Yeah. Right in the beginning of your talk, you showed this 
whole array of all the discoveries made so far, mm -hmm. and the frequency, time, thumbnails. Yes. Uh, a good fraction of them, you just see them with your naked eye. Yes. So, I mean, I know that the initial guy, the first guy, who really didn't really need all your template matching and all that, you, it just pop, pops out. But it looks like a lot of them pop out. So, so you're asking where are the low no, the low Yeah, low. yeah. I, so well, there, it must be conservatism on their, on their part. There must be a lot of such. intermediate. Exactly. Things. I mean, these look like enormous sigma events. Is I mean, look at that guy in the bottom, right? The second bar. Yeah, that one. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I, I mean, this visual trick does play that, you know. Some of them are extremely loud events. And there is a threshold, right? We want to see them with a false alarm rate, which is roughly associated with your uh, sigma. If you want to claim a phi sigma discovery. And how many sigma you think this guy is? That fellow, yeah. Uh, I, I, I don't know if I'm on the scale, but if to qualify as a gravitational wave tag, GW tag, you have to have a false alarm rate threshold. That is, I think, one per like a million years. Many events. That, and, that, and that is why we see this, you know, the later in the, um, uh, the we kind of keep seeing this, uh, where did it go? Yeah, uh, this kind of events by independent groups, including this. So LIGO did not claim, I mean, we may have seen those triggers, they may have been in one or the other search pipeline, but we discard them because the false alarm rate is not high enough. And there can be a series of more such. So we now are looking at this. So all, you can see all the tags are S, which are just what we call super triggers or something. The GW tag is not associated with them. It's a difference, an arbitrary but well-motivated distinction that this we cannot claim as gravitational waves. This could be gravitational waves, but we just don't have enough information at hand. Great, thanks. And we have one more question. So you mentioned that uh, Lisa has this hard limit at 10 years. I don't really understand why this is. It's four years. Four, four years. years. Four, four to 10? No, four. Four okay. is the mission expected oh, time. Hopeful thinking, okay. Just four years and that's it? But so four years of science data requirement. So it may have to run eight years if it only has a uptime of 50%. And the duty cycle. The duty cycle is dependent on, of course, how well you, know, you keep the geometry together. Okay, so this is because of data storage, or what is this? What is the reason? I'm not sure. So it's a free-floating satellites, right? So each of the arm, in the case of LIGO, it's fixed four kilometer, four kilometer. In the case of LISA, it's two and a half million and two and a half million kilometer triangle. But to keep that, there is an inherent error bar on how good the positioning of the free-floating satellite can be for you to do the interferometry constantly. Eventually, the geometry is so distorted that you don't have an equilateral triangle left anymore. Okay, I thought they had some, maybe some tiny thrusters or something to keep it in place. Yeah. Which it does, yeah. Yeah. every time. Out, yeah. They run out of fuel. They run out of fuel eventually. And they can't be powered by the sun. Yeah. That's a shame. Okay, thanks. But, uh, and that is why we see, I think the, what the community needs to sort of realize is that we don't have a gravitational wave detector after LISA, as of today. Well, I mean, we have 3G, right? So our 3G facility is ET, CE, right? But we're hoping ET is going to come back into play. But. And just in the time scale, so LIGO India, it's like one example I can give. We had a meeting with the Prime Minister signed you know, like 2016 when the mission object really started. We are still looking at 2030s or 35 to finish that detector. Exactly we know how to build it. If we start a 3G detector, which has a 40 kilometer by 40 kilometer arm length, there is just no way to realize this. Realistically, there is no way to realize this in the next 20 years. Unless the Chinese decide. Unless there is a different ways. Yeah, someone else is doing this that we don't know of. Uh, but I mean, if it's also we have learned from Kagra and other experiments. You know, the Japanese building the Virgo, which is the European. The tacit knowledge is the critical thing in making gravitational wave detectors work. And uh, even within a, such a strong, tight-knit collaboration as ours, the detectors are not at the same performance level. And so if someone is building a completely new detector without interacting with the whole community, 
uh, it's more and more unlikely, right, that they would be able to achieve in this sensitivity. Okay, great. There cannot be a secret uh, gravitational wave detector. That's only, only if it's useful for national security. It's, yeah. So it's it's private private funding says, and, uh, all the money and all the will in the world won't help. Yeah, it, you need the combined the knowledge that's been... For all space you need. For space space it's uncertain that, you know, the, if there is a parallel LISA kind of development that is happening in China, uh, we may be targeting a different frequency band or just better LISA or just faster than when LISA can fly. You know, these are all possible scenarios. Still is, I mean, LISA alone is a very difficult scientific concept. I, I cannot think of any astronomy mission more ambitious than LISA in its, in its, just the concept it is. It's bigger than the Earth and Sun combined, right? I mean, in just the scale of the detector. How, much, how expensive is it? Um, Billion? Close in like two, one to two billion is the numbers I've heard. Okay. Um, yeah. At least one big B. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So. All right. Thank you so much for a fantastic talk. Thank He'll you. be back at the ITC lunch talking to us about the moon. So please bring questions. And thank you so much for attending. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Yes. Uh, after the lunch. Yes. Uh, after the lunch. Yes. 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 Yes.